Okay, there we go. Um, so I'm going to start with a question. Uh, what do the following three people have in common? So uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, Eleanor Roosevelt, and this guy from Comic-Con who insisted on speaking Klingon to everyone that he ran into. Now, if the question is what do they have in common, you're probably thinking the answer is nothing. I mean, maybe the first two have something in common, but this third guy, the Klingon speaker, certainly doesn't. But what I want to try to convince you of today is that even that third guy, the Klingon speaker, actually has something important to tell us and has something uh, good and beautiful about human nature to uh, tell us about. So to go into a little bit more detail about the Klingon language, we go back to its roots, which of course take us back to Leibniz, the great German uh, philosopher and mathematician. You may know of Leibniz as the, one of the, the co-creator of calculus. Uh, you may not be so aware of the fact that he was very much interested in the question of language and reality. And he saw it as a problem that language did not reflect the reality of the world around us. Now, what do we mean by that? This is probably a problem you have not generally thought about. What it means is if you take a look at, say, those two animals, you, which you recognize, uh, you know that they look a lot alike. You know that they are a lot alike biologically. But think about what we call them in ordinary language, in English or any language. That's a dog and that's a wolf. Those two words have virtually nothing in common, but of course, biologically, they, these two organisms are almost the same. That's the problem that bothered Leibniz. That's the problem which bothered a lot of people uh, at that time. Um, now, you might be thinking, what a weird problem to be bothered by. Uh, surely that sort of, uh, that project didn't get anywhere. I mean, Leibniz is famous for a lot of things, but he couldn't be famous for that. But you'd be wrong in thinking that because, of course, this has profoundly affected the way that we do things now. Um, and in effect, this project was very successful. So when you're being careful and you want to talk about dogs and wolves, you use the scientific name. And in the scientific name, names, you can see the relationships among them or between these two these two animals. And of course, it's not a coincidence that that tradition of scientific nomenclature started around the time of, of Leibniz and you know, all of this community of people who were interested in that. So they, in a sense, you know, didn't completely solve that problem, but they went a long ways towards solving that problem. And many of the systems that we use today for understanding the world around us have their roots in Leibniz's project and in the projects of his contemporaries. Things like the periodic table, uh, things as diverse as the periodic table, the Dewey Decimal System, of course, formal mathematics, formal logic, all of these are ways of trying to understand the world around us and the relationship among elements in that world and trying to understand you know, how to represent truth and how to represent reasoning. So with Leibniz's project and those of his contemporaries, we can see really the first attempts at inventing a language in order to achieve some specific purpose. Or you might think of it more broadly, inventing a language or inventing a formal system of representation to represent relationships, to represent truth uh, and other things. So that was the first, probably most famous example of inventing a type of, of language. To see another example, we have to go forward in time a bit. So we'll go to the uh, late 19th century in Europe. And that was a time when international travel became uh, much more widespread than it had been in human history before that. Partly that was because of the advent of the railroad system. Uh, there are also things like things that we don't think about much now. We just take for granted the postal union, international postal union. That meant that you could mail a letter in London and be relatively certain that it would arrive at its destination in Moscow. That was not something that was possible before. It was really quite revolutionary. And of course, the telegraph made it possible for people to communicate, in effect, instantly across very, very long distances. And you add to this the fact that there was this growing middle class, so you suddenly had a lot of people who could take advantage of these technologies and be in contact uh, with people uh, across very long distances. 
Now, all of that's great, but what good does it do you to have breakfast in Paris and lunch in Berlin if you can't understand people in either place? And that was the problem that bothered a lot of people at this time. And it was a problem that people were, were faced with because of the technology that was available at that time, that all of a sudden you were able to go from place to place and cross distances, and then you realized, OK, when you got there, you couldn't talk to them. So this bothered a lot of uh, people in the late 19th century, in Europe in particular. Uh, one of the people that it bothered was a German priest, uh, Father Schleier, who had the idea, actually he said that God gave him this idea, this idea of creating a language that would be simple for people to learn, so it would be their second language so that they could use it to communicate with people in other countries. So it wouldn't replace their native language, it would be in addition to their, to their native language. And then people could learn it, and then we would basically solve this problem of communication across national boundaries or across linguistic boundaries. He did create such a language. It is, was called uh, Voilà Puc published it in 1879, and it was the hit of Europe. And it spread to many other countries, in fact, in the United States as well. It, it had uh, quite a bit of influence. Here's a picture of the uh, Volapük Academy in 1887, including many very notable uh, thinkers and intellectuals of the, the time. Um, here's a poster for the Third World Volapük Conference held in uh, a Congress held in Munich in 1887. Um, but I bet that probably most of you haven't heard of Volapük before, and so something must have happened. And in fact, it's not a coincidence that the, the pictures that I, the images that I just showed you were from 1887. Very shortly after that, the Volapük movement, which had been very, very strong, basically collapsed. And that's part of the reason why you haven't or you know, unlikely to have heard of it now. So what, what happened? Well, what happened was that a competitor arrived and sort of knocked Volapük out of the running. And this was the competition. And in particular, this guy, whoops, hitting the wrong button. Um, there we go. That guy in the center of the photograph is the Ludwig Zamenhof, who was an uh, ophthalmologist from what is now Poland. And he came up with a different language, uh, but sort of along the same lines, the same idea. And it was called Esperanto. And it basically took over the momentum that the Volapük movement had had up until then. A lot of people switched allegiance, and new people coming in decided to learn, generally decided to learn Esperanto instead of, of Volapük. Now, why did they do that? Well, here's a sample text in, uh, in Volapük. Au fato bas quel binol insuls, pai saludimus nemola. Que me meud mon argenola, yenemus vilolik, es insul isutal. I'm guessing that you probably didn't catch all that. Um, so let me show you the Esperanto equivalent of that. Patronia tu estas en la cielo, sanctigata estu via nomo, venu via regno, fariju via volo, kiel en la cielo, now, you might have a little more hope of understanding at least a few words of that, perhaps. You might even recognize that as being the Lord's Prayer, this text that is traditionally used to compare different languages, and that's exactly what this is. Well, of course, this was not lost on people. People could see that, oh, the Esperanto is relatively, feels more accessible, feels easier to learn, and it was, whereas the Volapük seems quite opaque by comparison. So, hence the shift in allegiances. Esperanto really took off. Within a few years, there were thousands of people who could speak it. Uh, by the end of the decade, there were probably tens of thousands of people who could speak it. And by early in the 20th century, it was more like hundreds of thousands of people who could speak it. So, this continues today. Uh, Esperanto is now just sort of part of the landscape. Uh, it's just a language that uh, that exists. It's not a huge language, but it's a, you know, okay, smallish size language. It's similar to languages that you have heard of uh, before.
So, um, so that's what happened then. So that was really the second major instance where people invented languages, and in this case this one now relatively large language, invented a language for a specific purpose, a language that wasn't existing naturally. We can go back to uh, the early 20th century for another sort of period when people began to invent languages. And this is a name, Tolkien, that you presumably recognize. And of course, Tolkien had the idea that if we want to like write fantasy novels and things where we're going to create uh, groups of people, races of people, tribes of, of people, uh, groups that don't actually exist in real life, if we're going to do that, well, then they have to speak languages that don't actually exist in real life as well. That only makes sense. And of course, that's exactly, exactly what he did. And it turns out that he was well equipped to do that because that was exactly the, the time when um, a lot of progress had been made in historical linguists, uh, linguistics, and not by coincidence, that was his academic specialty. So what we mean by historical linguistics is that people had figured out by that time, and this was actually a major achievement. Uh, now we take it for granted, but it was a major achievement at the time. People had figured out how to compare languages, figure out which languages were related to each other and which ones weren't, and how to reconstruct the ancestor languages of currently existing languages. That enabled Tolkien to use those types of techniques to create entire families of languages, to create the ancestors of those families of languages. All of this was just you know, things that didn't exist in real life, but that he was able to create given those techniques. And of course, this is part of the world that we all know of as the you know, Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit and the like was uh, something that he was able to create. So in more recent times, um, this has really taken off uh, thanks to the movie industry and uh, yeah, that's for some, yeah, there we go. Um, thanks to the movie industry and the television industry. So in the 80s, when the Star Trek movies uh, started to come along, uh, they basically hired a linguist to create the Klingon language, which as I'm sure you all know, plays a major role. Both the Klingon people and uh, the Klingon language play a big role in the Star Trek series of movies. Uh, in more recent times, for some reason that doesn't load the first time, in more recent times in the Avatar movie, you might know that uh, the Navi people play a big role, and there's a lot of Navi spoken in that movie. And even more recently, in the HBO series Game of Thrones, there's these Dothraki people and this Dothraki language, which again plays a big role. Now the question I'd like to ask is, why is this happening now? Why is this happening just over the last decade or last couple of decades? Movies have existed, you know, TV has existed for a long time. Why didn't, pe why didn't we see this happening in the 40s and the 50s and 60s? Why is it happening now? Well, I think there's probably a number of reasons for this. One is that American audiences are more sophisticated, more multilingual than they used to be. It's no longer going to pass if you just say, oh, the Martians are speaking Italian, uh, that's okay. People aren't going to accept that uh, anymore. It has to be somewhat more credible than that. And of course, the international market has become extremely important for the movie industry in particular. A movie can't be financially successful without that. And international audiences are not going to accept the idea of aliens speaking some gibberish language with American accents. I mean, that's how credible is that going to be? Not very. So if you want to sell movies, you have to do something better than that. Of course, production standards have gone way, way up, so the language has to go along with that. And of course, we've had tremendous advances in linguistics, so we now know a lot about how languages are put together, and we know a lot about how non-European languages are put together. So if we want to create a language that sounds different than major languages of the world, you basically know how to do that. Um, but I think perhaps the most important reason uh, for this increased use of uh, invented languages in movies is that people are no longer happy with these sort of cardboard characters in movies. So if it's some you know, science fiction movie, you know, the idea of having some um, 
Godzilla-type creature that doesn't have much in the way of feelings, that doesn't work. Or if it's going to be some other group of people, the idea of Indians as in, you know, the classic cowboy and Indians movie where the Indians were just these people who had no uh, feelings or emotions or motivations behind them. They were just sort of part of the landscape. That's no longer, uh, that no longer works. We want to know who these people are. We want to know what they are feeling, what is going on inside their heads. And in order to do that, they have to speak a language. They have to speak a real language, well, actually a fake language, but it has to sound like a real language in order to be credible. So my overall point is that even if you don't speak one of these languages, and probably you don't, they have nonetheless influenced you and shaped who you are and shaped the world in which you live. And more specifically, what I mean by that is that if you go back to looking back at, say, the time of Leibniz and the uh, sort of languages that he was interested in, what they were trying to do, what they did, was create systems to help us make sense of the world around us. And we still use some of the tools they created, but certainly what they were trying to do is something we are still trying to do, making sense of the world around us. And in that sense, you know, we are still all Leibniz. We're in the spirit of what Leibniz was trying to do. If you go back to the 19th century, people creating languages for international communication, uh, they were trying to really, for the first time, create some system where people could create, where people could communicate across national boundaries. This is something that we now all recognize as being very important. We know it's hard. It's really, really hard. But we know we have to do it. And the early Volapukists and the early Esperantists were the pioneers in that, and we're following in their footsteps. And so, in a sense, you know, we are all Volapukists, and we are all Esperantists, even if we don't speak those languages. And finally, with the languages that are developed for the literary and entertainment industries, what they're really trying to do is to make the other, make these other people seem like real humans or real creatures or whatever they are, and recognizing that we need to understand them. We want to understand their motivations and see them as real, fully developed, three-dimensional characters. And, uh, and that, too, I think is something that we all work on, but we all agree is something that's important. So to that extent, we are all Trekkies. So even that guy who's in the Klingon uh, costume, even he has something important to, ta to uh, teach us about the nature of what it is being human. So thank you very much.